So let's see what he had to say. He's writing to the Corinthians, and he's telling, uh, giving a report of what's going on. And he says, For we do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us, in whom we trust that he will still deliver us. You also helping together in prayer for us, and thanks that thanks may be given by many persons on our behalf for the gift granted to us through many. So that's kind of surprising, isn't it? That the Apostle Paul felt like that, that he was spared even of life. We don't hear too much about that in the church. And I wanted to see uh, what that word despaired meant in the Greek. And uh, it's a word, ex, ex, oh, I can't pronounce it anymore. I practiced it. Expario, I think. And what it means is to be utterly at loss, be utterly destitute of measures or resources, to renounce all hope, to be in despair. That's how he felt. He was confronted with this impossible problem, and there weren't any answers coming. And he started to, to lose heart. Have you ever felt like that? I have. I have felt like that. Um, I'll give you a little testimony. Um, so Julie and I, uh, Julie had a miscarriage in 2018. And uh, we had found out about the baby, and then it happened about three weeks later. And uh, I felt like that. It was just a crazy day of going to the hospital and just the mess and the despair and the sorrow. But the thing is, uh, the Lord met me there. And I want to show you how he does that. Let's uh, stay in Second Corinthians 1. Now let's go to uh, verses 3 through 7. Yeah, 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 7. This is the first part of that chapter. Um, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us all in our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or if we're comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast, because we know that as you are the partakers of the suffering, so also you will partake of the consolation. So that's really profound. Um, so the way that the Lord brought me consolation for all that was that it happened on Christmas Day of all days. And I, I didn't really know what to make of that at first. But then I realized, you know, and we named, uh, we named him Isaiah. So Isaiah died on Jesus' birthday. You know, that's pretty profound. And Jesus is the resurrection and the life. And that, that fills me with hope. And uh, it also causes me to fall on Jesus. Um, so, you know, in the same breath, you have the sufferings, but then you have the consolation. That's what Paul was talking about. And that's what we can expect. We may not get an answer sometimes, but we will get consolation. And, uh, you know, that's when we need to fall on Jesus, when we don't have those answers. And that's what Jesus invites us to do in Matthew 11, verses 28 through 30, he says, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So, Jesus, help, <laughs> you know? Sometimes it's all we can say. Sometimes it's all we understand. Jesus, help now, please. But is this the first thing or the last thing that you do? 
as something to think about. But what happens, though, when it's like with Paul and it seems like Jesus isn't there? Where it just, you feel nothing, or you feel terror, or pain, suffering. Um, what do you do? Um, well, when we go through a time of tribulation with not a whole lot of answers, we tend to react in two ways if we love the Lord. Um, the first is, this is the ideal. We submit to the process and gradually learn how to trust God in this new situation. That could be like a health thing, you know, some sudden health thing happens to you and it's consuming your life and you don't know what to do and you feel abandoned. But God is with you in this. He's promised consolation. That's like a deep abiding like love that he wants to, to give you, to show you that he's there, he's with you. Um, and the scripture I thought of is Proverbs 3.5. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Have you ever gotten to the bottom of your understanding and just sat there just perplexed? Like, even the bottom of your scripture knowledge. And you're just saying, like, what is going on? Well, God's word tells us not to rely on our own understanding at all. Paul got to a point where his understanding told him that he wanted to die. But then God delivered him from death and gave him consolation. Now, I, I just want to put this out here. We're going to have some altar time at the end here. And if you struggle with those kind of thoughts, if you struggle with suicidal thoughts, come up here. We'll pray for you. Um, but it was through that that Paul learned that he could trust God in any situation, in any trial. When he partook of the suffering, he knew that he would also partake of the consolation. <laughs> You know, and, and that, that could come a whole bunch of different ways, you know. Maybe you just feel the Lord's presence with you. You have, feel a special sense of his presence and love. Or maybe he sends somebody into your life to help you to pray with you and to help you understand and to teach you uh, what the word says. You know, it could come a whole bunch of different ways. We have to keep our eyes open because we might miss the consolation. Um, but... He learned to trust God in that situation, which turned his pain into deeper fellowship with Jesus, which gave him great joy. And that's kind of, you know, that's the ideal way. Um, Paul put it another way in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 7 through 10. Um, let's shift there. 2 Corinthians 4, um, oh, I'm sorry, verses 7 through 10. Paul says, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifest in our body. Don't we feel that dying here, especially... In these times, we feel we're carrying that kind of dying around. We see that the country that we love is turning into something almost unrecognizable. There's a dying that's taking place inside of, inside of us, a disappointment. But it says that that dying brings the life of Jesus because now we're turning away from all those things that we used to trust in, that we thought was going to carry us. And now we're turning to the only thing that can carry us, and that's him. Um, so... You know, Paul understood that as we bear the sufferings of Jesus, that will also manifest the life of Jesus on earth, here, right now. It's not, we're not waiting for heaven. The kingdom of God is within us. So we, we, the kingdom is here. He, that's what he told the disciples. The kingdom of God is among you. And the kingdom of God has come near you. So it's for right now. That's why it's happening. Um, and people need it. Um, so our character is going through a refining process so that God can put his power in us and use us to touch people around us. You know, as, God, as Pastor Brent keeps saying, you know, create, he's creating a greater capacity for God. We're not just doing it by talking to other people. He's doing it in us, too. He's creating a greater capacity for God inside of us through these trials. Um, 
And we have to keep enduring because he's doing a greater work that's going to equip us for the coming times. And we see, we see those signs. We see that uh, the things that Jesus talked about, say, in Matthew 24, the love of many growing cold, uh, the fact that there's going to be a falling away, that there's going to be a rise in false teachers and false prophets. We see these things coming. They're happening today. Uh, I don't know if you guys, anybody here is an Andy Stanley uh, fan, but I have to tell you something shocking. I was on uh, YouTube the other day, and he had his worship team playing uh, Stairway to Heaven in the worship service. It was shocking. Now, I'm not going to comment on, on him so much, but let's just say that things are getting all mixed up. And if you're not in this word, you're not going to know the difference. We really need to be in this word. But God can turn our pain into a purpose. He can give our pain a purpose. I know that everything that's ever happened to me, God has used it to touch somebody else. Every suffering that I've been through, every confusion, I've received that consolation, and he's come and used it. Um, so, but we don't always respond that way, do we? You know, we don't always, okay, God, I'm in it. Now let's go. You know, sometimes we feel like running away. And sometimes we might be in despair for a little while as we you know, come to grips with what's going on. Um, so the second way that we tend to respond when we're in a time of tribulation is we start to backslide. And you may notice that if you have a close walk with the Lord, you may notice that some of the, uh, you know, buckles are becoming unbuckled. Uh, fasting is usually the first thing to go. Uh, prayer and Bible reading. Uh, ministering to others, telling others about Jesus, and then maybe after a while, even church fellowship. We may just begin to drift away because we're confronted with this impossible problem, and it doesn't seem like God is helping us with it. And it just can bring us to a point of despair where we even might feel betrayed. Um, we may even blame God and get angry at him for seemingly not responding to our cries. We can be hyper-focused on the problem and completely lose sight of the Lord's goodness as we even begin to forget his ways and how to receive from him. That's kind of a scary thing, isn't it? I can tell you that I've been in various stages of all these things in my walk with the Lord at different times. And uh, the thing about backsliding is it doesn't ever get better. It just keeps getting worse. And as time goes on, sin will start to creep in our lives as we run from our problems and God. We'll get frustrated with God's ways, and we'll begin to turn back to our own ways. Because that's kind of our default, you know. Like when we were living in the world, we had all sorts of things that we used to deal with our stress and problems. You know, they might have been uh, a habit, an addiction, might have been just getting away, or whatever it might be. And... Uh, when we don't feel like we can receive from God, we'll start turning back to those things. And they'll start to take over. Um, let's look at Proverbs 14.14. 14. You guys might get out of here early today. Um... Proverbs 14, 14. The backslider in heart will be filled with his own ways, but a good man will be satisfied from above. And the way I interpret that is um, when you start to rely on your own ways again, you get caught up in a vicious cycle. Uh, like I say, maybe it's an addiction, some kind of habit. Maybe it's an inappropriate relationship, an emotional affair, things like this. Um, some of these things are really easy to start and really hard to stop. And so when you get caught up uh, in this cycle of backsliding, this is what I want to tell you right now. Don't give up. Don't give up. It's not the end. Uh, it doesn't matter how far you are from the Lord because he can come and get you as soon as, you're, as, soon as you want to be found. Um, let's look at, um, Lamentations 521. Yes, 
<laughs> You'll like this one. Lamentations 5.21. Turn us back to you, O Lord, and we will be restored. Renew our days as of old. As, yeah, renew our days as of old. So this verse is telling us that if we turn towards God, he will turn us back to him. What we see is that it's God's job to turn us back to him. But it's our job to turn to him and acknowledge that he is the Lord. That's what that verse said. He says, turn us back to you, O Lord. That's, that's humbling ourselves. We're saying, okay, God, I, I remember you're the Lord, and I need you. Um, and that's what happened in the parable of the lost son. Um, let's, let's go there, Luke 15. Starting in verse 11, it says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. That's basically telling your father, I wish you were dead. Can I have my stuff now? Um, and that many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions of prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but nobody gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Has anyone ever, here ever felt like the lost son? That the good times of pleasure are gone and you're just left feeding at a filthy pig trowel? That's an awful place to be. You need a come to Jesus moment. Look at verses 17 through 19 again. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? It says he came to himself. He remembered who he was. He remembered who his father was. Notice how sin made him forget these things. We can forget our identity in Christ when we get lost in those things. Now, he remembers that his father is generous and merciful. So he decides to go back and leave the pig pen behind. Now, if you want to be delivered, you must turn back by leaving the pig pen and acknowledging that he is the Lord. This is what true repentance looks like. Uh, I'll give you an example of, of how this can play out. Um, I know somebody that was in the army, and I'm definitely not condemning this person because he's got some mental issues, and it's been really tough for him. But what happened to him was he, he was, I think he was honorably discharged, and he's just living in the United States, and he got involved with the wrong people, and he was into drugs, and he got caught. I think it was in Florida. And uh, when he got caught, uh, you know, he was out on bail or whatever, and he just took off. And he never dealt with it. Well, because of that, uh, the Army um, or the Veterans Association, whatever, they cut off his money. You know, he would get a, a monthly check from his service. I don't know how that all works. but uh, So he lost, it was like 3000 a month, 4000 a month. So this guy has been homeless, living in this dirty van for like seven or eight years because he refuses to just go back and take care of it. You know, all he would need to do is just go back and do the little time. He probably, they probably just let him go during COVID, you know, and uh, then he'd be able to get his money again. And it's just, it seems really simple, right? But, you know, seven years down the road, you know, you get pretty confused, you forget, and uh, you can't see straight. Um, so that's, that's an example of how we can just get way off base. Um, 
And when God is just looking, he wants to restore us. He doesn't want that to happen to that guy. He doesn't want him to be out there like that. He wants him to come back into the fold. Just deal with this. This is where I am. Come here. This is where repentance is, but he doesn't want to go. Um, I mean, look at the graciousness of God here. Um, in verse 22, it says, But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again, and he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. I mean, that's the grace of God right there. I mean, he restored him before he even got a word out. You know, I mean, he said a couple of things, but he's like immediately put the ring on his finger. What that means is, is that he was restoring him into the family as a son. And um, in that culture, or probably many, most cultures, he would have had to pay that debt off. He would have had to work off all that money that he got that he wasted on prostitutes and whatever. He would have had to pay that all off before he was uh, able to be restored. But the grace of God forgave him of that debt, canceled it, and said, I love you. It's not about the money. It's not about the performance. Um, you know, like, for instance, there's a psalm, I forget where it is, it says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Now, that's a heavy verse, right? We don't like hearing that verse. I know I don't. But we focus on the iniquity, right? Like, okay, if I have this thing, God is not going to listen to me. Well, it's not about that. It's about your heart. It says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, it's like, it's not that what you're doing isn't wrong. It's that the, the worst thing is it's in your heart. You're saying, I want this more than God. You might not even think about it like that. But the way it's playing out is, I want this more than God. And God just wants to deal with that. He just wants to have our hearts. He wants to, he wants, he, it says he's jealous. You know, he's like a jealous husband. You know, when he sees his bride flirting with other suitors, he gets jealous. You know, that's what lo love is, jealous. You know, not not in a in a you know in in a godly way. It's a godly jealousy. Anyway, but this is what we need to remember. Scripture tells us that God will abundantly pardon us when we turn back to Him. So Hosea fourteen one through four. And this isn't a try-harder message, believe me. I know better than that. I don't preach try-harder messages. Because there's no amount of trying that's going to work. Uh, Hosea 14, 1 through 4. O Israel, return to the Lord your God, for you have stumbled because of your iniquity. Take words with you, like the words of the Son who said, Father, I have sinned before heaven and before you. Restore me. And return to the Lord and say to him, Take away all iniquity. Receive us graciously, for we will offer the sacrifices of our lips. Assyria shall not save us. We will not ride on horses, nor we sh shall we say any more to the work of our hands. You are our gods. I think we say that a lot in America, don't we? For in you the fatherless finds mercy. I will heal their backsliding. I will love them freely, for my anger has turned away from me. I mean, that's what God wants. He wants to heal our backsliding. He wants to love us freely. He wants that love, that two-way communication. So, but here's the, here's the thing. Maybe some of us here have been in this cycle where we just have this problem that we can't get our, hand, our heads around. And it, it brings us to a cycle of backsliding and returning, backsliding and returning, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Wow. That could, that could just discourage anybody. That could make you not want to come to church anymore. But let me tell you this. We got to get our eyes back on the Lord because the problem that we're dealing with that seems so impossible and so big to us, let, we need another perspective on that. And um, before I say that, um, 
if you have been caught up in that. Um, maybe you feel like you've wasted a lot of time. Maybe you feel like you've missed what God has for you. I want to tell you right now that that's a lie. Romans 11.29 says this, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable or without repentance. Meaning that if you're, if you're breathing, if you're still breathing, God has a plan for you. He doesn't, he wants to use you. He loves you so much. He wants to use you. It, whatever has happened in the past, today is a new day. This is the day the Lord has made. Um, so let us know that when we come to back to God, he, he can use us. He can use us again. He can use us in greater ways than we ever even imagined. So let me encourage you there, because God will never revoke your call. So there's still hope of you fulfilling it. Don't believe the lie of the devil that God has shelved you because of disobedience. As long as you're still breathing, God has a purpose and a plan for you, which is bigger than you can understand. If something is impossible to do right now, just know that he has something more for you. Okay? But let's look at this. How do we overcome the impossible? I think we have an answer in Scripture. This is a, 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 a pretty good illustration. Um, and, you know, sometimes no answers are forthcoming. But God will show you how to walk this out and fulfill your call, even with the insurmountable problem. So let's ask Joshua and Caleb how they handled insurmountable challenges. Let's go to Numbers 13. And we're going to start in Numbers 13, starting at verse 17. We'll end up in 14, kind of skipping around a little bit. So I'll try to make it clear. So starting at verse 17, this is... Uh, after the Israelites have come out of Egypt, and God's had them, you know, he took them through the Red Sea. They saw all the miracles, the crazy, incredible miracles. And now they're at the point where they're about to enter the promised land. They're about to go into the land of Canaan and find out what God has promised them. And so Moses says, let's send out some spies into the land to find out, like, what's going on. So they sent 12, uh, one from each of the 12 tribes. This is what Moses said to them, verse 17. Then Moses sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up this way into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like, whether the people who dwell in it are strong or weak, few or many, whether the land they dwell in is good or bad, whether the cities they inhabit are like camps or strongholds, whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests or not. Be of good courage. And bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first ripe grapes. And then skipping to 26, it says, Now they departed and came back to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. Then they told them and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. That's like, uh, they had like giant grapes. I mean, like they had to two people carry this, you know, thing of grapes. Um, nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. The Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea among the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone with him, gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants, and all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak came from the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight, and we were in their sight. <laughs> That's really depressing. Um, okay, now let's go to chapter 14, starting at verse 5. Because uh, basically, uh, their bad report 
pretty much convinced the whole uh, congregation of the children of Israel not to go. And the next day, they're all crying in their tents, and they're begging God to send them back to Egypt. And then, then they start talking about throwing out Moses and Joshua and choosing a new leader and just going back. I mean, this is, this is the effect that a bad report can have. But this is in verse 5. This is after they heard all this. It says that Moses and Aaron fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. But Joshua, the son of Nun, and Caleb, the son of uh, Jephunneh, were among those who had had spied out the land, tore their clothes. And they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows, which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So they got to the point where only faith could carry them forward. You know, like if you thought about it in the natural, um, you know, coming against an army of giants is probably not a good idea, you know. And so the ones that gave the bad report, they were looking at things in the natural. Yeah, there is no possible way that they could defeat all those people. No way at all. And it terrified them that God was asking them to do that. And that may be like some of the problems that we're facing right now. It's like, God, how in the world am I supposed to do this when, you know, it's like, it's overwhelming, right? But look at what Joshua and Caleb said. They said, the Lord, the Lord is going to do it. The Lord's much bigger. Uh, so it's kind of like um, we, were at a, we were at a conference just the other day, and this guy was teaching on this, and he said, uh, the, uh, the spies that gave the bad report, they said, the giants are so big, we can't go. But Joshua and Caleb said, the giants are so big, we can't miss. <laughs> you know? And, and that's the perspective difference. When you come to a point where only faith can carry you forward, you either believe God's going to get you through it or you don't. And if you choose don't, then you're going to be in a world of hurt. Because the problem, God isn't going to just take it away. Sometimes he does. Yeah, sometimes there's great deliverances. Sometimes there's mighty miracles. Sometimes we just, you know, read the Bible or read the gospel, see the amazing things he did. But sometimes we have a problem that God doesn't just take away. And we don't want to face it. It just seems impossible. It's, it's, it's making us feel, you know, sorrowful and depressed. And God's not taking it away. And maybe he's not even explaining a whole lot about it. God didn't tell them how he, they were going to beat the giants. He just said, go. And I think that's what God is saying to us. We need to look at our problems, our impossible problems, from a different perspective. We need to have the same spirit that Joshua and Caleb did when they faced those giants. They saw God is bigger than their problems, and that gave them the faith to move forward. So Joshua 1.9, have I not commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. We need to change our perspective about the problem and see it from God's eyes. It may seem huge when you put it next to God, but when you put it next to God, it's tiny. Just like the giants look small to Joshua and Caleb, be strong and very courageous because God is with you. Don't give up because Jesus isn't giving up on you. He's teaching his children the true meaning of John 15, 5. This is, I believe, what God has been teaching us in this hour. This is certainly what he's been teaching me. Radical dependence on Jesus. He's teaching me to depend on him in ways that I never believed that I would need to. He's teaching me that I am weak in places I thought I was strong. He's teaching me that the foundation I thought I was standing on wasn't made of anything um, solid, you know, but Jesus is the true foundation, you know. Sometimes we grow up in church, and we hear a lot of things, and we don't 
really understand how it all works, and Jesus has to kind of shake that out. Or sometimes we just get overconfident or whatever it is, but he wants us to have this radical dependence on him where we just know that he's the only answer to all of our questions and that his fellowship is enough. Even if the answer doesn't come, even if the feelings don't come, even if the problem doesn't get solved, because that was his attitude when he went to the cross. He, didn't, he said, Father, if there's any other way, but nevertheless, not your will, but my, not my will, but your will be done. That has to be, and, and look what happened. God sent an angel to strengthen him, gave him the strength to go. And when he was on the cross, he had the right attitude. He said, Father, forgive them. Can we say that in the middle of our problem? Can we say, Father, forgive them? Well, that's what he wants us to do. So that's what I got today. And uh, thank you. And I want to invite uh, you guys up to the altar for prayer or anything. Um, if there's something here that the Lord is talking to you about or you're struggling with, because the thing is we need each other. We can't do this alone. That's the other part of this. If you're stuck and even if you don't want to come up here today, uh, maybe it's a little embarrassing or whatever, reach out to somebody. Let somebody in. Because I know me, I can go on for a long time without asking some for help. And I can come to the end of my rope and not ask for help. And it's stubborn pride. We need each other. So I just want to encourage you guys and uh, just know that Jesus is going to do it. Don't give up. Don't give up.